Sosit în România la invitația partenerilor noștri de la Totul despre Mame, invitatul nostru susține o conferință despre iubirea necondiționată în creșterea copiilor și își lansează la noi o carte fascinantă cu titlul Parenting Necondiționat. În speranța că vă stârnesc interesul, vă ofer un citat din acest volum. Parentingul condiționat reflectă tendința de a vedea aproape orice interacțiune umană, chiar și între membrii unei familii, drept o tranzacție economică. Legile pieței, cerere și ofertă, după faptă și răsplată, au fost ridicate la rangul de principii universale și absolute, ca și cum totul din viața noastră, inclusiv ce facem cu copiii noștri, este similar cu achiziționarea unei mașini sau închirierea unui apartament. Am încheiat citatul. Doamnelor și domnilor, suntem onorați să-i spunem bun venit la Garantat 100% domnului Alfie Cohen. Conditional parenting, in your view, is very similar to the free market mechanism. Um, what will a child become after such a type of education? Well, we don't have to speculate. We have a fair amount of research by now to indicate right. what happens. When children feel they have to earn their parents' love as if it is an economic mm -hmm. transaction, um, they learn to accept themselves only conditionally. I am only a good person when I do well in school or in mm -hmm. sports, when I hide my anger, when I'm nice to other people, when I'm attractive or funny or otherwise deemed more worthy. And Psychologists tell us that unconditional self-esteem is practically uh, the same as, or at least an important component of, psychological health. Mm -hmm. To be able to know that even when we make mistakes, we still have a core of faith in oneself. I'm still a, a competent and mm -hmm. capable and lovable person. But when our parents put uh, conditions on our val on our worth when when we have to uh, jump through hoops as we say with with animals um, in order to get a prize and here the prize is love uh, we come never to accept ourselves as ultimately good because we're only one mistake away from thinking of ourselves as incompetent and unlovable so the worst thing we can do to children is to use our love as a kind of trophy Um, that we award to them when they please us or impress us. Instead, we need to give them the message, no matter what you do, even things I don't approve of, I will never, ever stop loving you. Someone could ask, isn't this pure anarchy? I don't see how the absence of a government maps onto the level of psychological dynamics and interpersonal relationships. If you mean, are we not giving up control mm -hmm. of children, um, authoritarian control, the answer is happily yes. If you mean, does this mean that children will run wild without any sense of moral purpose or direction, the answer is absolutely not. In fact, mm -hmm. children tend to act out in a bad way, to misbehave, um, to do what is uh, disturbing mostly in households where they have been over-controlled with right. punishments and rewards. When children are loved unconditionally, that doesn't mean we don't offer guidance. It doesn't mean we don't offer direction yeah. and help. It means we spend time working with children rather than doing things mm. to them to make them obey. Here's a quotation from yourself. You said, Imposing a penalty is not at all likely to be a constructive thing, end of quotation. But I know lots of people that could say penalty is the very root of a normal strategy of raising a kid. If by normal you mean typical, I'm afraid you're correct. <laughs> If you mean healthy or desirable, again, absolutely no. A penalty says, a punishment mm -hmm. says, um, When you do something bad, something bad has to be done to you. The message that a child hears from a punitive mm -hmm. parent is, do this or here's what I will do to you. I will make you suffer in some way and that is supposed to make you a better person. When you think about it that way, when you strip bare our assumptions and our backgrounds and just look at it logically, there's no reason mm -hmm. why making someone suffer would improve that person 
morally or psychologically or any other way. What it teaches children is people who have more power than I can use that power to hurt me, to make them do whatever, make me do whatever they want. That has never in the history of humankind made people more ethical and more caring. All it does is make them more self-centered because now they think, what do I have to do in order to avoid the penalty from this person with more power? Right. And so um, if we say we don't hit people, some people, it's a tragic irony, may even hit the child. We don't hit people. I mean, this would be funny if it weren't so tragic. When we're modeling, we're setting the example of using violence. But even when we use other kinds of penalties where we deprive children of things they enjoy, uh, mm -hmm. foods, privileges, chance to, because they disobeyed us, because they, were, they did something late, they were disrespectful, they hurt someone else. This doesn't lead children to ask, what kind of person do I want to be? It leads them to ask, how do I avoid getting caught? How do I do exactly what I want to do without getting the consequence? Because the consequence is to me. Yeah. So the use of penalty, however common it might be, fixes children's attention firmly on their own self-interest and makes them less concerned about the impact of their actions on other right. people. Um, I'll give you two examples that you use. Um, you will go now to your room. Uh, this is a penalty. Is it as efficient, as effective as some could believe? Well, people who are more traditional mm -hmm. um, would say it's not punitive enough because the child might enjoy being in her room, which makes me crazy to hear a criticism like this. No, we have to hurt the child more effectively. That's not enough suffering. Right. You know, um, let's assume that the child doesn't want to be deprived of company, um, doesn't want to be alone, finds that fearful or unpleasant so that it is an effective uh, penalty. Does right. the child, what does the child think sitting there alone in the room? Does the child think, huh, now I see that hurting people is wrong. I mean, it's laughable. Why Obviously. would we ever do this? What does the child think about? Uh, maybe this is so unfair. I'm always mm. blamed for it. And my mom never sees that my sister was uh, goading me into doing this. I'm always the one that's blamed. Or the child thinks, I'm just not a very good person. Apparently, I'm not worth spending time with. That's why they keep sending me here to be by myself. Or maybe the child just thinks, I am going to get my sister when my parents aren't looking. No possible result mm. of this is constructive and useful. And there's also a quotation from yourself, um, which I find really very spectacular in terms of understanding. You said, much more important than what we feel for our children is the way they perceive these feelings and the way we treat them. Can you please comment upon this? If you ask parents, do you love your child unconditionally, almost every parent would say, of course. But that doesn't matter, because what predicts to certain outcomes for children is not our intentions as the adult, but the perception of the action of the person to whom the action was done. This is true in all areas of human life, for managers with employees, for teachers with students, right. and with parents to children. What, what empirically leads to certain effects are the ways that a given behavior is understood and interpreted by the person to whom, who experiences the behavior. And in fact, one interesting research study questioned young adults and asked, did you sometimes feel that your parents loved you conditionally, that you had to earn their love by being good in school, by being well behaved in front of mm -hmm. their friends or whatever. And a substantial portion of them said, absolutely, yes. So then the researcher said, was that effective? And it turned out that sometimes it was at getting temporary compliance. 
Sometimes the children who were made desperate for their parents' approval worked harder in school or tried hard to be good in sports or tried to pretend they weren't angry or whatever would make their parents happy. But the long-term effects were very disturbing. The children who felt they had to earn their parents' love by doing whatever were now more resentful of their parents and alienated from them as young adults. They didn't want to spend time with them. Mm -hmm. And they felt psychologically unfree. They felt as if they were being controlled from inside. The motivation was internal, but it was not fully owned mm -hmm. and integrated. So they weren't able to take pleasure from their own accomplishments. Um, so when you ask, does conditional parenting or do rewards and punishments work? Are they effective? The answer is that they can be effective only to get one thing, which is temporary obedience, but at a huge cost to the mm -hmm. psychological well-being of the child. There's also something that, I don't know, this can be pronounced also in a light manner, as half joke, let's say. Mm -hmm. And this is, if you do something like this, I don't love you anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the consequence of this? Well, that's what I've been talking about up until now. That's conditional parenting. Um, if, I mean, number one, the child may infer, perhaps correctly, that it's not really a joke. But number two, exactly that message in earnest right. might be inferred when it's not even said explicitly. The child just has to watch the, the parent pull away. Um, if not physically, then emotionally, when the child does, does something wrong, mm -hmm. as if you're turning off the affection, as if it were a, a, a switch, a volume knob, you know? Um, or conversely, and this is just as destructive, turn up the affection. The big smile, the hug, the high five, the thumbs up, when the child does something that pleases the parent. And that teaches the message, I have to do this in order for my parents to really care about me. But care that has to be earned isn't worthy of being called care. Um, you say in your book that there are kids and teenagers that can develop a false self by pretending, and then said that, by pretending they are somebody that could be loved by their parents mm -hmm. and not themselves. Right. So in other words, children by a certain age get a sense of what they have to do in order to be pleasing to their parents. Right. And that may mean uh, being nice or pretending to be nice to everyone even when they're, they're not feeling it. Or it may right. mean um, being, being uh, the smartest person in, in class. Or it may be uh, having a, a, a funny joke to make my parents laugh. Or it, it could be any number of things. But slowly, in order to get that desperately needed parental approval and affection, they begin to take on that role as if they were an actor in a play. Um, and when you do that long enough, you, f you lose sight of who you really are underneath that role. And it takes people many, sometimes decades, maybe a lot of psychotherapy, um, to realize it's all been an act. Mm. And parents unwittingly cause that phoniness that alienation from one's true self by demanding that children act the way the parent wants the child to be. Let's talk a little bit about power versus love. Um, doing my homework for our meeting, I saw a conference on the internet with, a, with an outstanding expert in psychology and parenting, and he was talking about, and I quote, calm and confident authority, about gaining and losing points of authority. In your point of view, this is like taming animals or something like that. Can you please talk about this? Well, the traditional approach to parenting is that to be the parent um, is to attain and retain control over the children. Um, and some people say we do it in an old-fashioned, harsh way, which may include physical violence mm -hmm. over children. Um, 
which teaches children to use violence. We have unmistakable evidence now that children who are spanked or hit, slapped by their parents, become depressed and become aggressive, um, taking advantage of whoever has less power than they do, maybe another child that same afternoon. I will interrupt you just for one second. Mm -hmm. Somebody could say, well, in the world you can find also kind and um, normal spanking. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how physical violence with small children could right. ever be kind or normal. I, mean, I fully agree. I mean, to me, as sickened as I am by the idea of men hitting their wives or girlfriends, mm -hmm. I find it far worse to talk about adults hitting children under any circumstances and for any reason. But people who don't share that value judgment of mine need only look at the scientific evidence to see compelling data showing the uniformly destructive effect on the child of being hit. What it teaches, the lesson it teaches, is um, when you have more power than someone else, you can hurt them to get your way. And that is the lesson that, that corporal punishment teaches. But even parents who would never dream of taking a hand to a child and would, in the word of your the expert you quote, use calm and confident power that doesn't require hitting, may nevertheless be teaching the same message. It's just power by a different means. I can have power over you and also um, screw you up pretty well by simply um, withdrawing my love from you when you displease me. Sometimes that can be even more alarming to a child, terrifying even, than if I got a spanking. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm still learning. This is, a, this is a, a relationship that is basically about control. What do I have to do to bring back um, my mother or father and be in their good graces again? And the same is true of other forms of punishment, um, what's called time out, which is a euphemistic term for the forcible isolation of young right. children when they need us most. But the problem I try to argue in my book is not just with the technique of getting control. I'm not saying use a timeout instead of a spanking. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying be calmer in your imposition of force and power. I'm asking people to reconsider the goal of a relationship that is based primarily on power and control. And again, to come back to something you asked later, uh, earlier, yep. that, that doesn't mean that the child can do whatever he wants and we just watch. This is a mm -hmm. false dichotomy, an either or, that is set up um, disingenuously by traditionalists. If we don't have calm and confident power, if we don't use penalties, then we are permissive. Then anything goes and it's a laissez-faire approach right. to parenting, which is completely false. The alternative to what I call a doing to approach to parenting, involving conditional affection, punishments, rewards, power, is not doing nothing. The alternative is a working with approach where when children do something that troubles us, Mm -hmm. We don't see it as an infraction to be punished. We see it as a problem to be solved together. And I don't have a simple recipe to say, when your child does this, you stand here and you say the following in this tone of voice. And the second time he does it, you say this. I mean, this kind of one-size-fits-all recipe is disrespectful to both children and parents because um, how we respond will depend on many different features of Lots the situation. Of people will ask for a recipe. Of course. Uh, that's the nice thing about punishments and rewards. They don't require time, <laughs> talent, care, um, uh, or courage, because you never have to question your own requests. What will you answer to that? Alfie Kahn is good. He seems to be an innovator. His theories are fascinating but they have no practical support. They're just fascinating conference topics, but with no relevance in real life. 
I, I, I don't know how to, first of all, I draw these theories not in a vacuum. I didn't think of this stuff in the shower this morning. This comes from real life and from scientific research that ends up ratifying and supporting it. As for its practical application, I mean, I can show you all the lovely notes I get from people who read this and say, this mm -hmm. approach transformed my family. And I always say, I didn't do that, you did that, but I'm, I'm glad to have, have called you back to your own best instincts as a parent. And on the other hand, I'm hardly the only person. I'm standing on the shoulders of, of people who've been writing and thinking, psychotherapists and researchers and wise people who, who don't do this professionally, but have found that their children respond to unconditional love. This works better in the real world than traditional control-based theories. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. With your kind permission, I will recommend your book. Thank you. Uh, recommend cu toată căldura și cu tot entuziasmul Parenting Necondiționat de la recompense și pedepse la iubire și înțelegere. O carte, după părerea mea, obligatorie.